To the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So there is a, another coincidence of humor for me today, but this coincidence of humor is one of the gospel passage. Deacon Susie, just a couple of weeks ago, you read those same verses at my wedding, that same gospel passage from John. And right before we were wed, Joe and I heard these words from Jesus about loving one another, about laying down one's life for one another. And then we embarked on our honeymoon, and because, well, we're both busy priests in our everyday lives and have been since we've known each other, those 12 days were the longest stretch of time we had ever spent together. <laughs> I think there were some taking bets on whether or not till death do us part might come um, before we return. But as you can see, I am here. There's still a ring on my finger, so I think we're all right for now. <laughs> Well, in today's epistle reading from 1 John, we hear this pastoral letter to a church that's in the midst of conflict, and it starts with this, this powerful reminder. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Everyone. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Now, as a bit of an aside, I think pairing this line in particular, but this reading from 1 John with the um, reading from Acts, really all together help us interpret Jesus' commandment to his disciples to love one another. Back in Acts, we hear that God showed up right in the middle of St. Peter's sermon, didn't even wait till the end, but while St. Peter was preaching, the Holy Spirit showed up, and, well, I'm assuming the sermon must have come to a halt right then and there because he commanded that they all be baptized right then, right there. Now, right before that passage, what we didn't get to hear today, God had been preparing Peter for that. God had given him this vision of food descending from heaven, but this food that was coming to him was food he was not permitted to eat as a Jew living under the law. And when he reminded God, hey, I've, I've been keeping the law, I probably shouldn't eat this stuff, this voice says, what God has called clean, you must not call profane. This was a reminder to this apostle. It's a reminder that Jesus had fulfilled the law, that Jesus was drawing even the ones previously deemed unclean into the fold. And so, when God showed up, St. Peter, the apostle to the Jews, commanded that all these Gentiles be baptized immediately, brought into the fold right then and there, to be given new life. He didn't say, but first go clean up your act and come back, or even figure out what baptism is all about. Just receive it. Receive the free gift. Join the life of the church. And that passage reminds us that there is to be no division, but instead that through Christ and in the waters of baptism, God has leveled the playing field for all of us, that Jesus has fulfilled the law, has died to atone for the sins of the whole world. And so whether Jew or Gentile, cleaned up or living in licentiousness, all, all are invited to receive the free gift of Christ's loving grace. So that's the preface coming back to that line from 1 John that where we hear that everyone, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God and continuing on that whoever loves the parent loves the child. So if you love God the Father, then you're, you're to love God's children. And it's to be this natural response. It's not a heavy commandment. In fact, as he goes on to say, God's commandments are light. They're not burdensome. And this letter to the church in conflict, 1 John is saying to look, look around at all the beloved children of God. See them for who they are. See their faith. Hold on to the faith. 
The faith that is our belief that all of us, various humans of all of our stripes, all of us have been brought into Christ's fold through his one death for the sins of the whole world. For the way of new life, he has opened for all of us. That means faith isn't about any one of us and how perfect or imperfect we might be perceived. But that faith leads to love and charity and unity. And it's that kind of faith that conquers the world. This world of sin and death and hell, none of that, none of it stands a chance against this total trust, this belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the chosen one sent to heal the divide between heaven and earth. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, meaning even those who don't look like Jesus or live like Jesus can stand to benefit from his saving work, that all are welcome to follow him into new life. That's what allows even Gentiles, those who weren't born into the historic people of Israel, to be baptized into the faith immediately, as we heard in the book of Acts. This good news, this gospel should propel us to go be evangelists in the world, to go out and to share this good news with anyone and everyone because it is good news for anyone and everyone. To proclaim that Jesus has made a way for us, all of us, to freely follow, it is good news because in doing so we get to experience a bit of heaven here on earth. It's good news that we don't have to fear death and hell, those things that divide and conquer, because they've been vanquished. That's the Easter message. There's no matter whether or what someone has done or looked like or anything else that can truly cause division, because we are all called to be and to see each other as beloved children of God. And sometimes that means even looking in the mirror to remind ourselves, despite the flaws we might perceive, that we are beloved children of God. The person in the rearview mirror is a beloved child of God even when they're trying to run you over. That the person you really don't want to agree with is a beloved child of God. It means watching the news and remembering that every person on on every side of every conflict is still a beloved child of God. And when we receive the gift of faith, the faith that levels the playing field, that makes all of us equally co-heirs with Christ, that's when we can know what it is like to abide in God's love. Jesus said to his disciples, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No greater love is there than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And then Jesus looks at these disciples, looks them in the eye and say, You are my friends. If you do what I command you, I don't call you servants any longer. Because the servant doesn't know what the master is doing. But I've called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. So that the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. And I'm giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. And so friends, friends of Jesus and friends with one another, 
we have heard the commandment to lay down our lives for another, to have that kind of love. The commandment to abide in Christ's love. Christ's love, which is long-suffering, the kind that will go all the way to the end to fight for the other. It's the kind of love that we are to have, to reach across the divide, to see all the other beloved children of God, not just in a smile across a church aisle, but to have the love of Christ so fully in our hearts that it just runs over and we can't help but go out and share it. It's a love that bears the fruit, the fruit that will last, the fruit of love that will last when one has to look at the other and say, I have absolutely no idea why you did what you did or how you could possibly think the way you think. It's a love that will last when the world's at war and it's hard to know which way is up and down or left and right. It's a love that will last when the world of sin and death and hell, all those things that try to divide. It's a love that will last, hold God's beloved children together in unity. Jesus commands his disciples to abide in this, his kind of love, for it's his kind of a love that allows us to love one another when we don't really even want to. It's Jesus' kind of love that allows us to love that nasty neighbor we really wish we didn't have to put up with. It's Jesus' kind of love that calls us to go out into the world giving up our own opinions and prejudices and calendars and treasures and anything else, including even our very lives, so that others may know the full joy of Jesus' kind of love. And our faith in this love that conquers the world, it will bear much fruit. Amen. Amen.